Hello and welcome to the Witch Shorts podcast. I'm Rob Lilly Jones. We're back with some brand new episodes, all read by the brilliant team here at Witch. And before we get on to today's episode, a huge thank you to all of you who got in touch with your feedback over recent weeks. We want to bring you the best podcasts we possibly can, and it was great to hear from so many of you on your thoughts for how we can do this in the coming months. Remember, you can still email any thoughts to podcasts at witch.co.uk or leave us a rating and a review wherever you're listening. Now today, we're heading stateside to the shores of Lake Michigan as we explore the city of Chicago. To read us this article, originally written by Witch travel editor Rory Boland, I'll hand you over to Angus Farker. When Captain Streeter's 35-ton steamboat, the Riotan, ran aground on the Chicago shore of Lake Michigan in 1886, thousands of miles short of Honduras to where he was running guns, he did what any of us would have done, declared himself sovereign over 186 acres of prime shoreline and attempted to sell, blackmail and defraud the wealthy landowners into buying back land they already claimed. The captain, who was never an actual captain, remained purposefully shipwrecked for decades, inviting city construction workers to dump rubble alongside the sand accumulating around the boat. This added blocks to the city, which Streeter duly announced as the independent district of Lake Michigan and sold lots to naive homesteaders. This story could have been forgotten when the law caught up with Streeter in 1902, but it endures because his sheer audacity captures the pioneering spirit central to America's sense of identity. Men of pluck and grit, of opportunity and coercion, who forged a nation. It is a very Chicago story, Geoffrey Bayer tells me, as he directs my view over the captain's former empire, now known as Streeterville, from the top of the hundred-story Hancock Tower, officially known as 875 North Michigan Avenue. Geoffrey is a presenter on Chicago's PBS affiliate WTTW. Celebrated for his shows on local and national history, he agreed to meet to help me understand the city better. Why? Because Chicago remains one of America's least visited big cities, it doesn't even warrant a mention in the 19 destinations listed on the front of Visit USA homepage. The twist is that those who do visit routinely rate Chicago as the best city in America. I asked Jeffrey and other lifelong Chicago residents to show me why. Jeffrey picks Hancock Tower for my Chicago welcome as it offers a visual history to one of the first truly American cities in many regards. No idle boast. Unlike Boston, New York and LA where settlers originally tried to build a life that resembled home, Chicago was a wholly American affair. After the revolution, Jeffrey explains, second and third sons of eastern businessmen, many with no family business to inherit, came to make a fortune as real estate speculators and railroad tycoons. The city exploded with opportunity and money as the country raced west. Chicago's first non-indigenous settler, Jean-Baptiste Pointe de Sable, a free black man, built his farm next to the Chicago River in 1780. A little over a hundred years later, Chicago had one million residents and was the second largest city in the US. And here, among saloons and wagon goods stores, its citizens established a city that defined what modern American life would look like. Luckily for us, they decided to look up. From the 360 observation deck at the Hancock, the flat Midwest stretches for 50 miles in every direction, the perfect canvas for more than 100 skyscrapers backlit by the twinkling water of Lake Michigan, our mountain range, Bear calls it. The world's first skyscraper was built here in 1885, and while the home insurance building was subsequently demolished, the 16-storey Manhattan building by the same architect from 1891 still stands and is one of the world's oldest skyscrapers. This Chicago school of architecture would change the way we live and inspire the skyline of every modern city in the world from Des Moines to Dubai. I walk along the Magnificent Mile, a 13-block tree-lined avenue through the heart of downtown, walled in by stately turn-of-the-century hotels and palatial department stores. The grandeur of the architecture is staggering. It makes the Champs-Élysées look like a mucky back street. 
I end up at the riverfront which gently separates the city in two. Here, the perspective widens. A canyon of towers stretches along the contour of the riverbank, from Tribune Tower, the self-proclaimed most beautiful building in the world, to Sears Tower, perhaps the only building to double as Gotham City and Metropolis. The scale and style creates a sense of place and time that only a handful of world cities like Florence, Kyoto and Prague can achieve. The 20th and 21st centuries laid out in steel, glass and blazing technicolour. I point out to Geoffrey that Chicago doesn't get much credit for skyscrapers. Most people, myself included, associate skyscrapers with New York. New Yorkers like to talk, he shrugs, and points to a skyscraper built for one famous New Yorker, Trump Tower. Every other Trump building in America is unbelievably gaudy, he says. You can't do that here. In Chicago, Trump had to hire a local architect firm. Then the mayor ordered him to add a spire. Sherman Diller Thomas is even surer of Chicago's pivotal place in history. Everything people love about America came from Chicago, he says when I tell him about my skyscraper revelation. Gospel and house music. There is no blues or R&B music without Chicago. He takes a breath perhaps considers that I might not be of reliable musical taste. Did you know McDonald's really got started in Chicago? Sherman is better known to his fans as Diller, the son of a Chicago nurse and cop. He works for energy company Commonwealth Edison, but rose to national fame for his social media videos documenting Chicago history and tours of city neighbourhoods. We meet at Jubilee Juice and Food, a cafe grill in the rapidly gentrifying Fulton Market neighbourhood, where he used to eat when working nights for Com Ed, because they accepted meal vouchers. Over smoothies, Sherman tells me the fabric of Chicago is not downtown, but the suburbs. He grew up and lives on the south side and describes his childhood as idyllic until he was about 12, when he got tall and attracted gang attention like every young black man in a city that remains one of the most segregated in the country. Ethnic neighbourhoods are important in Chicago, from Polish to Puerto Rican. There's a pride in diversity, but their establishment is not a happy tale. Take Humboldt Park, Diller says. People on the east side of Humboldt Park wouldn't rent to Puerto Ricans. People on the west side wouldn't either, so Humboldt Park is a Puerto Rican enclave. Diller's own neighbourhood, Gresham, went from 100% white in the 60s to 95% black today. His break, as he describes it, came from being first a lifeguard and then ComEd substation operator. Those jobs took me into other neighbourhoods to see other ways of life. I dined in sukas with Jews celebrating sukkot and ate piles of free noodles in Chinatown. Diller's mahogany tours roam all over, but trips to Bronzeville, the city's historic black neighbourhood, are popular. That's no surprise. It may be the most remarkable neighbourhood in America. Bronzeville boomed in the 1920s during the Great Migration, when hundreds of thousands of African Americans escaped the southern states. I come on Sunday as congregations of historical Baptist churches set up by those migrants are out and the neighbourhood blooms. Established in 1921, Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church is famous for getting churchgoers singing. Gospel music was first sung by Presbyterian Gaelic communities, but the African-American gospel widely known today started here when pianist Thomas Dorsey was asked to put a bit more soul into the hymns. What resulted was a 100-strong chorus of uplifting song. I watched congregants older mostly, trickle through the door, men in dark suits, women in brightly coloured dresses and wide-brimmed hats. There is laughter, lots of it. Numbers have dwindled, though, maybe a hundred to fill the grand 1,200-seater auditorium with its horseshoe gallery and choir loft. Disappointingly, unlike other US cities, no Chicago church with gospel choirs except tourists. Meanwhile, plans to build a national gospel museum in the shell of another famous gospel church, Pilgrim Baptist, seem stalled, and really, Bronzeville should have half a dozen museums. In summer, sunbathing is an unexpected addition to a Chicago holiday. That's the tale of this town. It's unexpectedly cheap. The filet mignon at Gibson's, the fanciest place in town, costs $53 and is the best steak I've ever tasted while a four- or even five-star hotel is half the price of New York City. It's cleaner 
and less crowded than other big cities, which makes doing most things more comfortable and more enjoyable. But most unexpected is discovering what a pivotal place this city played in shaping not just American life and culture, but the rest of the modern world. Visit or don't, but next time you hear the blues, jazz or R&B, tuck into a Big Mac or admire a skyscraper, think of Chi-Town. Flight prices to Chicago can be stubbornly high because no low-cost transatlantic carrier has made it there yet. Choices are American Airlines, British Airways and United, all from London. You may find cheaper prices with a stopover in New York or Boston via JetBlue or Norse. Or you could also take the overnight Amtrak train once in New York or Boston. Thank you to Angus and to Rory Boland too for his piece originally published in the January issue of our travel magazine. And remember you can find more articles you'll find useful every day on everything from money and technology to home and garden advice by signing up to one of our many free email newsletters. And you can do that at witch.co.uk forward slash newsletters. We'll be back next week for another episode of Witch Shorts and thanks for listening. Witch Shorts was produced by me, Rob Lilly-Jones, while the exec producer was Grace Farrell.